Om Amritishri Nam. A very good morning to everyone present over here and those who are yet to join. So we warmly welcome you to the third day of the eighth annual conference of Cognitive Science. I hope you are all having a fresh mind this morning and ready to roll. Starting the day with a keynote talk by uh, Dr. Ned Block from New York University, USA. Today we'll be having our third talk session and poster session, and yet another keynote talk by Dr. Bhavani Rao from Amrita Vishwavidya Pit. Towards the end of the day, we'll have the valedictory function and the general boarding meeting. So let's move on to the fifth keynote session of ACCSA. And for that, let me introduce to you Dr. Narayanan Srinivasan from IIT Kanpur. Dr. Narayanan Srinivasan is the professor and head of the Department of Cognitive Science in the Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Dr. Srinivasan has been a visiting scientist at the Rick and Brain Science Institute and visiting professor at the University of Rome. He has a master's degree in electrical engineering from Indian Institute of Science and PhD in psychology from University of Georgia. He has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Louisville. And Dr. Srinivasan is interested in understanding mental processes, um, especially attention, emotions, consciousness, self, and decision making using multiple methodologies. He has more than 150 journal publications, uh, book chapters, and full papers in conference proceedings. Dr. Srinivasan is a fellow of Association of Psychological Science, National Academy of Psychology, India, and uh, Psychonomic Society. He is currently an associate editor of Frontiers in Cognitive Science, Cognitive Processing, Royal Society, Open Science, and Neuroscience of Consciousness. He has been the Secretary General and is currently the pres uh, President Elect of National Academy of Psychology, India. He is also a founder member of Association for Cognitive Science, India. I heartily invite you, sir, Dr. Narayanan, to chair the fifth keynote session of ACCS 8. That was fun. Uh, thanks, Akhil. It's, it's a really a great pleasure to uh, have Professor Ned Block giving his keynote lecture uh, in this conference. Uh, many of us know his work, but let me briefly uh, introduce him. Professor Ned Block is the Silver Professor of Philosophy, Psychology, and Neuroscience at New York University. Uh, previously, before that, he was at MIT, where he was chair of the philosophy program. Uh, Professor Block obtained uh, his PhD from Harvard, where he worked with uh, Hilary Putnam. Um, he works generally in the areas of philosophy of perception, foundations of neuroscience and cognitive science. He is currently writing a book on the perception cognition border, the border between seeing and thinking. I'm assuming that the, the talk is related to the book. Uh, Professor Block has won multiple awards and honors. I'm not going to read all of them. You can check out his website, but uh, just to name a few, he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a fellow of the Cognitive Science Society. Uh, he has been a Gallenheim Fellow, a senior fellow of the Center for the Study of Language and Information, Sloan Foundation Fellow, um, recipient of the Robert New Alumni Award at MIT, the Jean Eckhart Prize, uh, I mean, I will stop here, uh, is this past president of the Society for Philosophy and Psychology. He has co-edited multiple books, uh, The Nature of Consciousness, Philosophical Debates, for example. Um, I know about his work, I mean, he has argued against functionalism for those of you who are students. Uh, he has made a distinction between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. And today he's going to talk about an empirical argument that perception is non-conceptual. Uh, Ned, uh, please take over. Uh, uh, thank you, Narayanan. Uh, uh, that was a very nice introduction. Uh, I, I first want to start by apologizing for, for getting you up so early in the morning. Um, and I also want to say that um, I'm happy to have questions at any time. Um, I think the um, um, maybe the best thing to do is to uh, send a message to to Shiam um, when you um, if you have a question. Okay, so the topic uh, is an empirical argument that perception is non-conceptual. So I will explain what that means as I go along. But first, let me say something about why I think it's an important question. So it is important partly because it's relevant to the architecture of the mind. 
So if perception is conceptual, then the difference between cognition or thought and perception may not be as fundamental as one's thought uh, if they're both in the same category. Um, second, it's relevant to epistemology. If perception is conceptual, then the epistemology of perceptual belief is just believing what we see. We can just infer from the perception to the judgment, the thought, the judgment. Um, but if perception is non-conceptual, then it cannot participate in an inference. And so we need another model. And I think we do need another model. Uh, a fourth is an application to robot vision. If it's of the essence of perception to be non-conceptual, then if we were able to make a robot whose camera fed directly into cognitive processes, that robot would not be seeing. Um, now, I think we'd probably speak as if it was seeing, but uh, I think it, uh, strictly speaking, it wouldn't be seeing. Let me move now to what a concept is. So in the famous Greek myth, um, Oedipus has two concepts of Jocasta. Uh, uh, he, he conceptualizes her as his wife, uh, but also um, he conceptualizes that same person as mom. Of course, initially he doesn't know they're the same person, but he has two different concepts of her. So a concept of something involves a way of thinking about it. Um, and thinking, when I say thinking, I mean cognition broadly construed, including evaluating, deciding, expecting, reasoning, problem solving, and working memory. So a perceptual concept involves a uh, perceptual way of thinking. And we can have different perceptual concepts, like for example, a tactile concept of a circle and a visual concept of a circle. Importantly, concepts always involve actual or potential cognition, where cognition is defined in the way that I just mentioned. So it's always um, actual or potential uh, uh, cognition. Now, I don't mean that it's sentence-based. I think non-linguistic creatures can formulate expectations. Um, from a, a cognitive science point of view, I think a minimal condition um, on um, uh, cognition is, that, on concepts is that they must be able to play a substantive role in working memory. And I'll get to a little more about what that is. Okay, so my, the basic outline of my, uh, what I'm gonna be saying is I'm gonna give a developmental argument. The argument is that infants four to six month olds have color category representations. By the time they're 11 month old to 12 month olds, they have concepts, color concepts, or maybe just proto concepts. And by the time they're three, they have real linguistic color concepts. So here's just another presentation of the same idea. This is the four to six month old who has ca color category, perceptual categories. This is the 12 month old who um, uh, has some form of color concepts. And here they have color perception without color concepts. Um, so uh, I'm now going to explain about categorical perception and then I'll say, give some of the evidence that they don't notice colors. So categorical perception, I'm sure as everybody realizes the in the rainbow, this is a continuous band of wavelengths, but we see it as striped. Um, and the behavioral signature of categorical perception is faster and more accurate discrimination between categories like between green and yellow than equal distance be within categories. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the work of uh, the Sussex psychologist, Anna Franklin. Let me expand this a little bit. Um, so one of the tasks she uses, of course, these are nonverbal infants, um, so you need nonverbal tasks. One of the tasks she uses is 
uh, she shows the infants a, a uniform screen with a disc of a different color. Now, if the baby sees that disc as a different color, it will tend to move its eyes to the disc. And if the background and the disc are of different color categories, then they will move faster and move their eyes faster. So this is a way of deciding what their color categories are. Another method of deciding what their categories are is the method of habituation, where you have a camera up here and the, the, an experimenter is looking at the child's eyes and what's presented, this is one form of habituation, if you present the same color again and again and again and again, the baby will stop looking at the screen altogether or look only every once in a while. But then if you have what the baby sees as a different color, the baby will look to that side on where the different color is. And if the baby sees it as being in a different color category, then the baby will look longer. So that is another method. Now those methods and some other methods have been used um, to map the color categories of infants all around the world. And infants have five color categories, which you could describe in English uh, 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 using these, these terms. It may not be completely obvious from this diagram because this is only a slice through the color solid. So the, um, um, the lines linking two boxes indicate no novelty preference uh, as between those two. And where there are gaps like here, that um, indicates significant novelty preference. So, you, so that's, that, that novelty preference is used to map the, these, um, uh, these color categories. So, and we can explain, um, uh, uh, Anna Franklin has shown how you can explain those color categories uh, from the opponent process structure of early vision. And she uses this, uh, near infrared spectroscopy method, um, which I won't go into. So starting four to six months, they have nearly adult level color discrimination. They move their eyes to what they see as a different color. They're bored by the same color. They look to the side with a new color and another a phenomenon they use, they use um, a, a brain imaging to detect an oddball effect where um, if, it, if it's a different color, you get a, a stereotypical ERP response. Um, so um, now I'll move to um, the fact that infants six to 11 months old do not normally notice color. So remember, this is the key age. So here is one experiment that shows that they do not normally notice color. Um, this is called the tunnel effect. If you have a green ball rolling behind the screen and then a red ball emerges, an adult looking at this sees a compelling impression of continuous and uniform uh, movement. If the screen is just a little bit wider than the object that goes behind it. So Wilcox 1999 showed that if you have a, a, a ball going behind and then a box emerging, the, um, uh, the uh, four and a half month old infants look uh, longer at the box, but not if a red ball turned into a green ball. At seven and a half months, they, uh, 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 were uh, sensitive to shape and kind information. I could explain more about what that is. Um, and it isn't until 11 and a half months that they're surprised when a green ball turns into a red ball. So this is one of many items of evidence that six to 11 month olds do not normally notice color. Now I say normally, you can train them to notice colors. And this sometimes leads people to think 
Maybe the infants have a concept of color as a temporary property of things. So there's evidence against that. If you show six to eight month olds uh, normal colored things as opposed to odd colored things, they prefer to look at the normal colored things. In the case of flowers where there is no normal color, they don't have any preference. Um, and there is good reason to think this is a similar phenomenon to memory color, but I, I don't have really time to go into that. Um, so you may object, maybe the infants have a concept or proto-concept of color and some evidence for this is this training. So if you train them by um, giving the different colors a function, so the green thing is pounded as a hammer and the red thing pours, then um, nine and a half months old will look longer at the red ball changing into a green ball. And with three rounds of training, a seven and a half month old will look longer. But the, so here's a bigger version of that. Um, but the key fact here is that, oh, well, I'll, I'll skip that. Um, it does not follow that before training, they have concepts or proto concepts of color as a temporary property of things. In fact, it doesn't follow they even have it after training. Um, it shows that they notice color, but not that they have a concept of color. So what I'm talking about is normally less than 11, earlier than 11 months, babies do not normally, I without training, notice color. Um, and even when they do, we can't conclude that they have any concept of color, but um, uh, still uh, uh, they don't normally even notice it. So what would show that they have a concept or proto concept of color? Well, here's an experiment that tested something that would suggest if it worked out for color. So this is a uh, genre me Hochmann. And what he did was he presented infants with something on the left or something on the right um, or both. And if they were the same shape on the left and the right, like both, both discs or both triangles, then something interesting would happen on one side or the other. Uh, interesting from the point of view of a child. Um, the, so for example, a jumping frog that made, it, made a wonderful sound would appear say on the left. Um, so 12 months old formulated expectations. If the things were the same shape, but same color, they could not learn. So again, another piece of evidence that before 11 to 12 months, they are not sensitive to color. And notice that even if color were a temporary property of things, same color at, a, at an individual time can predict something interesting. Now this is a more impressive experiment than the tunnel effect because it uses working memory. And working memory is the gateway to cognition. So I'll say a little more about working memory. So as I'm sure everybody knows, working memory is controlled by the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but links between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and uh, perceptual areas um, in the temporal lobe and, and occipital lobe and a bit of the parietal lobe um, are set up to be controlled by, by um, working memory. So here are some other experiments that use work, working memory. This is an experiment from, from the year 2000. And the idea of it is this. You have a screen, a disc comes out and goes back. Then a triangle goes out and goes back. And then when the screen rises, you can either have a disc and a triangle or two discs. Um, before 12 month olds, they were su surprised at a change in shape, but not a change in color. So if a red thing went out and a green thing went out, they were not surprised to see two green things. Again, another piece of evidence that they're not putting color in working memory. Here's another one. This is expectations about number. And I'll just show you a, a better version of it. One color goes out there, another color goes out there. 
And under 12 months, they don't expect two things. So the general uh, conclusion is that babies use shape and kind information informing expectations about number of months earlier than they use color. So to summarize, at six to 11 month olds, normally no color representations of working memory and hence no color concepts. And just to remind you, this does not require working memory because you can do it all with perceptual representation. So now I'll go to color language. So in the US, on the average, children know four basic color words only by the years, by three years, three months. At least that was true in 1980 uh, when Mabel Rice did this experiment. Um, and she took a group of two to three year olds who knew no color words and taught them the difference between red and green. For most of the children learning this difference took over a thousand trials over several weeks. So it's very hard, even at three years, three months for children to learn four basic, the four basic color words. Um, uh, Charles Darwin, uh, commented on his own children. He said, um, I attended carefully to the mental development of my young children and with two or as I believe three of them, soon after they had come to the age when they knew the names of all common objects, I was startled by observing that they seemed quite incapable of affixing the right names to colors and colored engravings. Although I tried repeatedly to teach them, I distinctly remember declaring that they were colorblind. And many parents have had this um, same experience. And a term was coined for it in the early uh, 20th century um, called Farbendumite, color stupidity. Now, I should say that um, children are learning color words earlier than they used to. And no doubt that's because they see these things instead of the kind of thing that um, uh, uh, Darwin's children would have been looking at. Um, so there is evidence from IQ testing in Europe that um, uh, most children did not know the basic color words until they were seven years old. Whereas in the US in, in 1980, it seems to be uh, 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 three years, three months, maybe it's even earlier now. All right, let me move to the difference between categories, concepts, and linguistic concepts. So here is the, the diagram that I'm uh, of my claims about development. Color category representations at four to six months, concepts at 11 months, linguistic color concepts at three years. Now you may wonder why aren't color categories um, a kind of concept? And the answer is they play no role in inference. So um, uh, I'm using the word concept so that uh, a diagnostic for concepts is that they can play a role in, inf in inference. I should say though, that whatever you call this difference between what they can do um, um, uh, at, at four to six months and what they can do um, uh, at 11 to 12 months, it's of fundamental importance. Now, what about adult color perception? As I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, um, the uh, visual system, uh, uh, the left visual field is processed mainly uh, because of these, uh, of the right side of the retina, both retina is mainly processed by the right hemisphere. Um, and so, uh, oh, actually, it's a little, oh yes, this is right. Um, so what about adults? So here is some evidence that maybe adults have conceptual color perception. And the evidence is that uh, what Anna Franklin showed was that infants uh, show the categories, the color category uh, 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 signature only in the um, uh, left visual field. That is, this is within category, this is time. So they're slower within category than between categories. 
Whereas adults are show this signature in both hemispheres. So you might think maybe what happens is uh, children have right hemisphere color perception, and then uh, it gets replaced by the left hemispheric colors that come with language. So here are three um, possibilities. Replacement of non-concept in adults of non-conceptual categories with concepts, preservation of non-conceptual categories, but modified by top-down influence, and both, both non-conceptual and conceptual color perception. So I'm gonna present some evidence that this is right, that preservation of non-conceptual categories in adults is the right idea here. So one bit of evidence comes from color agnosia. So that is uh, a, a, a phenomenon which um, uh, there can be damage to color categorizing um, and color con conceptual areas uh, with preserved normal color perception. Um, so these subjects often have little or no ability to note when objects are colored with their characteristic colors. They've lost all their knowledge of color. So uh, one patient studied recently was shown um, cases, uh, was shown stimuli like this, uh, where uh, uh, some were in different color categories and some were in the same color categories. And um, they were asked um, whether they, uh, which were the same categories. And then they were also asked, um, uh, uh, to where is brown? And the, the uh, for example, uh, it, that would be the correct answer here. And what they found was that color categorization did not predict naming and naming did not predict uh, categorization, suggesting, as they say, that this result challenges the hypothesis that adult color categorization and color naming depend on the same set of neural processes. It looks like perception and categorization are, are separate in the brain. Um, so um, uh, that's some reason to think that um, uh, adults still have non-conceptual color perception um, and that that patient had non-conceptual color perception. Here's another experiment done uh, uh, just recently. So uh, subjects were shown uh, uh, Gabor patches, these grids, um, on the left and on the right, chosen at random from a bunch of different colors. Uh, they also could see um, um, uh, th these things were, were also randomly assorted in the um, angle uh, of, um, uh, of, of the Gabor patch, of the angle of the grid. Uh, and so this is the key phenomenon here. Um, what happens later was just a matter of making sure they were paying attention to both the color both the color and the orientation. So they would see either a color circle on the left or a color circle on the right. If they saw it on the left, they had to uh, pick the, they had to move a cursor to the right color. If it's on the right, they have to move a cursor to this color and a similar thing for orientation. And then what they looked at was decoding of color. And so the question was, where was color best decoded? Was it decoded in conceptual areas like prefrontal cortex or in perceptual areas? And the answer is overwhelmingly perceptual. This is the nose, these are ears. Overwhelmingly perceptual areas in the back of the head and uh, uh, in the uh, contralateral opposite hemisphere from where the stimulus was, which strongly suggests that the uh, that perception that the, the that the um, uh, that the colors are being represented in the standard perceptual areas and not in conceptual areas, so they're both in the back of the head and they're contralateral. That is on the opposite side from the stimulus. Um, and here's what they say: they say activity in posterior electrodes, that's the back of the head, contralateral to the decoded stimulus were the primary contributors to the decoding 
of both features, that's uh, orientation and color, suggesting that visual sensory processing was the main source of decodable signals, ruling out alternative exp ex explanations such as the verbal labeling. And an additional feature is that the best decoding took place 150 to 350 milliseconds, uh, which is too fast for much thought. Global broadcasting takes um, uh, more than 300 milliseconds. So uh, these three facts suggest that um, uh, adults have uh, color perception similar to that of, of, um, of children, namely, uh, uh, dominated by the perceptual areas and not by conceptual areas. There are some additional items of, of evidence. Uh, one is that uh, the time it takes to move your eyes to a target of a different color category is the same for both hemispheres. There's no uh, advantage for the left hemisphere as would be expected for verbal concepts. And presumably conceptual processing in addition to perceptual processing would take additional time. So these all lead to uh, the preservation hypothesis that adults have non-conceptual color categories may be modified by top-down influence. Um, so just to summarize, um, six to 11 month old infants have color perception without color concepts. There's some evidence that adult color perception does not involve an extra conceptual representation. And then one caution, none of this shows that high level perception or object perception are non-conceptual. So it could be for all I've said, now color is a low level property in the sense that it is computed by peripheral tra transducers um, and um, processed very early in the uh, ventral processing stream. Uh, there are high level properties like face perception, for example, or causation that are that are, are that take much more time and are much higher up in the visual processing stream. So none of this shows that high level perception or perception of objects, these are not um, uh, there's no per object perception here. So there's still some loose ends. So just to summarize, <coughs> infants can see colors at near adult levels at four to six months, <coughs> and they perceptually categorize colors. They can use shape, size, and kind information informing expectations and as inputs to rules at least six months earlier than they can use color. Two years later, most Children do not know the basic color words. <coughs> and most children don't seem to know what color talk is about. And something I, I haven't covered, which is substantial reasoning with color seems to happen at the same time as learning color words. And this all suggests that six to 11 month olds uh, have color perception without color concepts, so it must be non-conceptual. Now, rem I remember I raised at the beginning, why is that important? And just to remind you why it's important, it's important to the architecture of the mind, to robot vision, and to epistemology. And uh, uh, that's the end, and thank you so much. Um, I think I see one question already. Thanks, Ned, for the talk. Um, Bapi, you want to go ahead and ask the question yourself? See there. Okay. Or let me ask the question myself since he has typed it. Um, I'm going to read the question, Ned. Um, so, one question is developmental profile of color perception, categorization, and naming is contrasted with that for shape dimension. So, basically, color is being contrasted with shape. Would you agree that shape also follows a similar developmental trajectory or is it more innate? No, I think shape does not follow a, simple, a, a similar developmental tra trajectory. Uh, uh, children seem to have some kind of shape categories pretty, uh, uh, 
maybe maybe not conceptual, but proto-conceptual pretty early on. Uh, so the experiment I showed were uh, uh, four and a half months they're surprised at a ball turning into a box. So uh, no, color is unique, but its uniqueness makes it uh, a very suitable thing to show that there, there is at least some um, non-conceptual perception. So it's an existence proof. At least some perception is non-conceptual. Okay. Uh, here is a question from Amrita Valli. Uh, is it possible that infants prefer to use shape or kind information to differentiate objects in the tunnel and color working memory tasks? Would such a lack of preference also be seen in the infant's behavior as a lack of surprise? Yes, yes. I, I showed um, some experiments where they weren't surprised. For example, in the tunnel effect, they weren't surprised at a red thing turning into a green thing. Yeah, so I showed many experiments where uh, color changing didn't surprise them. Okay, so here is another question from Arun. Could it be that color is less salient and the shape controls used in the experiments are biasing the infants towards shape concepts? Um, well, color is certainly less salient because salient means um, you notice it and they're not noticing it. So that's why those experiments, uh, they, uh, despite perceiving color, they're not noticing these odd color changes the way an adult would. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know, as a follow-up question. In other words, we would see color concepts if there were no shape controls in the experiment. So basically he's asking if there were only color stuff happening. You don't need the shape controls. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, color, when a red thing changes into a green thing, they're not surprised. I mean, the, the shape controls are there to show that they are watching and that they are surprised at some things. Okay, got it. Um, so there's a question from Bobby. I also see you distinguish between low level perception and high level perception. Can you elaborate more on it? Yes. Uh, so, um, in my book, I go through a lot of ways of, of, of making the low-high distinction. So the one I just mentioned was low-level perception is uh, are uh, controlled by peripheral transducers. High-level perception involve a lot more processing. Another distinguishing feature is that um, early on in the um, uh, in the visual system, there are very small receptive fields, and uh, Later in the visual system, there are much larger receptive fields. Um, receptive fields being the area that a cell responds to. And the high level properties uh, are typically responded to areas that have very wide uh, um, uh, receptive fields, you know, faces, causation, agency, that kind of thing. Okay. Um... Right now, I don't see any other questions, so let me ask. <laughs> I have a couple of questions myself. Uh, one question is that, I mean, uh, I, I know you want to be careful, but do you want to argue that uh, a lot of perception are, uh, is non-conceptual or just color? Uh, yeah, no, I think all perception is non-conceptual. Now, it's not that easy to leverage color to these other things, but my way of doing it is to point out that color perception, shape perception, et cetera, show very similar phenomena. They both are subject to the same kinds of adaptation, the same kinds of pop-out phenomena, um, they, uh, the same uh, phenomena involving visual search. Um, uh, so there are many different phenomena that suggest that um, uh, a color is of a kind with shape and um, you know, uh, other kinds of perception. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is, um, uh, it, it, you know, uh, Prince Ar and I guess even Jack and Dove argued for some kind of an intermediate level theory of consciousness, right? Linking yeah. uh, consciousness to mid-level uh, surface based in the case of vision uh, representations. Yeah. Uh, how do you think this links to that kind of arguments? I'm not sure if there's any big link. I mean, I don't agree with them. 
because I think we are aware, for example, of a commonality between faces that are pointing in different directions, one in black and white, one in color. Um, you know, that's not mid-level. You know, uh, um, so uh, I think there's high-level uh, phenomenology of perception too, uh, but I don't think it really interacts. At least I don't see an interaction with the kind of issues I'm talking about. I see whether there are other questions. I don't see them. Is, are there any other questions? Um, you can raise your hand also. I can call you or you can type in the chat. Okay, I see another question, a fairly long question. So let me read it. Um, two questions, in fact. Uh, does evidence from infant studies suggest that our ability to notice color is hardwired in us, or is it something we learn through exposure to environment? Uh, that's one question. Uh, okay, so it goes on. Do preverbal babies from different linguistic backgrounds show differences in their capability to notice colors? So let me stop here. Uh, as far as okay, okay, so the the only work I know on the the uh, the uh, different language groups uh, comes from um, uh, Anna Franklin's lab, and she's done a lot of cross cultural experiments, and uh, so she says uh, at least early on, preverbal infants don't show any sign of color of, of the color language in there. There are no differences across many different language groups. Later on, of course, there are. It's a part of the question then is uh, that initial color perception, is it innate or learned, I guess that's Well, right. of course, you know, we're, we're, we are hardwired to detect color. We have this opponent process system and all that. And I think it would be kind of shocking if that weren't, uh, uh, so in, in some sense, but I guess maybe the way I would put it is the capacity to notice is hardwired, but it takes a while before the, the child is clued into what the property is. Okay. So the other question is, if color perception is non-conceptual, why is it that we associate specific colors with specific concepts of threat or calmness? Of what was the last word? Uh, with emotions, like threat or emotions, calm, yeah, yeah. or cool, uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So let me say two things about that. That's an interesting question. Um, so of course we have color concepts. We adults have color concepts. And those concepts are subject to all kinds of associations with fire and ice and hot and cold and stuff like that. However, I should say also that the last time I looked at the literature, it wasn't clear that there were any innate associations. And that people in different circumstances and people of different ages show different associations. Um, so it's really very, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's more work that I don't know on this topic, but uh, at least from what I know, um, it's not clear that there are any associations of colors with emotions that are somehow part of our constitution. Um. So uh, this is, uh, again, if all kinds of perceptions, perception may be non-conceptual, what could be the trajectory of their development? Uh, is there any evidence for such from other aspects of perception or other modalities? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question. So of course, there's a lot of things happening with uh, our conceptual system in development, um, you know, the development of color concept, the development of other kinds of concepts, Maybe I didn't really get the question. No, the question is that, uh, I mean, you, you have argued that color perception is non-conceptual, but what about other aspects or other modalities? Is there any evidence or? Oh, I see. Are there non-conceptual perception in like smell or taste or hearing? Uh, I would like to know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't know much about modalities other than vision. I'm, a, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, combining the linguistic question and your question whether all perception is non-conceptual, again, this is a culture-related question. Would there be significant differences in how people from, say, pictorial languages like Mandarin, 
Chinese or Japanese, I guess, a background perceives shapes and colors compared to, let's say, a language like English? Yeah, well, this is a much discussed question and I don't really know the relevant research. I'm skeptical that different languages really influence perception, but I, I'm, I'm open to the possibility. You know, there, there is a, 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 you know, of course, every, uh, the, you know, uh, Benjamin Lee Wharf many years ago postulated that different language groups have wildly different conceptual systems. As I understand it, that work has all been refuted, but there are sort of uh, more modest effects. But I don't know much about it, I'm afraid. Here's another question. Uh, is there any preliminary work on generalizing the experimental paradigms, uh, I presume uh, with infants, discussed to testing higher level visual perception as non-conceptual? Yeah, I don't know of work of this sort on um, higher level properties. It would be nice to, it would be interesting to, to do. Okay, one more. Um, so the, this question is evolutionary. So if most forms of perception are non-conceptual, would it serve the evolutionary significance of having perceptual mechanisms? Yes. Uh, I'm not completely sure I'm I sure understand either. that. So my, so my picture is that the purpose or the main purpose of um, perception is to give you is to give the perceiver news, news about the here and now. Um, and I think that in order to use that news, uh, you have to conceptualize the perceptual information. Um, so I think that's clearly an evolutionarily inculcated uh, ability. I, well, maybe I can rephrase this question. It, it... I mean, from a from evolutionary perspective, uh, why we would need, I mean, why can't we have this conceptual content from the beginning in some sense, right? Uh, I think it's because the perceptual systems are largely autonomous. So for whatever reason, we evolved a setup where we have these, you know, pretty modular perceptual systems. I think the, the main, you know, there's been a lot of arguments uh, recently um, about um, uh, cognitive penetration of, of, of perception by cognition, the extent to which um, uh, cognition affects perception. Now, I think there are such effects, but they're pretty, um, they, they're pretty much confined to ambiguous stimuli. So there are many ambiguous stimuli where if you're given a hint, you see it one way, uh, whereas maybe you started off seeing it another way. Um, but there is, I don't think there's widespread cognitive penetration. So it looks like we have a fairly modular perceptual system. Well, I Why evolution cho chose to do that is a mystery to me. <laughs> well, I know you have written about this, but let me ask anyway, but what do you think about, uh, you know, Marisa Carrasco's work uh, that attention kind of influences uh, perceptual appearance? Oh, I'm a big fan of her of her work and that in particular. And I think that attention, that top-down attention is one of the ways in which cognition can can influence perception. You know, we we use our cognition to uh, uh, to control attention. I think the most dramatic effects are in feature-based attention, where we're attending to a particular property, and that creates enormous effects on perception. Yeah, and she's shown all kinds of wonderful, you know, she's really nailed that phenomenon that um, uh, attention affects the way things look. I think uh, things have stopped. So let me stop. Thanks, Ned. Thanks a lot for a wonderful talk and your patience in answering all these questions. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great question period. I, I uh, uh, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks for inviting me. And I hope you'll invite me to an in-person meeting sometime. Looking forward to Ned. I really am so grateful to both Naran and you to having had you here. And uh, probably 
as I was talking to Nanan and we are on the backwaters of Kerala. So probably uh-huh. we would love to have you back right here and then probably actually have a session with you on the boat or something like that in the future. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, we took, a, we took a big boat ride when we were in Kerala. Uh, we had a great, we had a wonderful time. I'm looking forward to the next time after this COVID uh, scenario goes down a little bit. <laughs> oh, I'm hoping for it, yes. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Narayanan. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Narayanan. Bye-bye. Oh, check. My apologies again for getting up so early in the morning. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Narayanan, for chairing the session in such a well-ordered manner. And in fact, we are honored to get a chance to work together with you in this conference. Thanks a lot, sir. And thanks a lot, Dr. Ned, for a detailed explanation of categorical perception of colors and working memory, color languages. In fact, it was fascinating to know that the babies don't even use color concepts, but shapes in the initial months of their lives. So it was a, such an interesting talk, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for being here with us.